Good morning. Good morning and welcome to worship on this sunny but chilly Sunday morning. Whatever happened to spring? We had a few good days and now it's back to winter it seems. There's even some ice on the driveway. I hope you were careful as you came in this morning. But it's good to be in this nice warm sanctuary on this very special day in the life of our church and, and churches around the world as we gather on what we call Palm Sunday and also Passion Sunday, remembering what the events that are to come this week. If uh, you haven't already done so, make sure you get a palm branch. If you forgot to get one on your way and go run right now and get one from the ushers, uh, you'll want to wave your palm branch with us in a moment. In fact, just a word of instruction, we typically stand for the call to worship and go right into an opening hymn. Today I'd invite you to remain seated. Uh, we'll hear the bells and then we will remain seated for the call to worship so we can watch the children and adults that are singing with them process in, waving their branches, and then we'll all stand for the opening hymn, All Glory, Lot, and Honor. And wave your branches on the chorus only, or you'll, your arm will get too tired after four verses. Of <laughs> we'll wave our branches together. It is a great uh, day in, in the church, full of joy and just like a parade, you know? That's what it's all about. So if you haven't already done so, take the friendship pad and register your attendance with us. And uh, remember, members especially, that's where our name tags and introduce yourself to anyone you don't know this morning. Well, let us now prepare our hearts for worship on this special Sunday at the sound of the bells. Please remain seated, but be prepared to join in the call to worship. Humble and riding on a donkey, acclaimed by crowds and caroled by children, you are giving the beast of burden, you are giving majesty, you are giving those who long for redemption, with them, with heart and voice, we shout, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Before we go any further in worship, we must pause to acknowledge our need for God's grace. You can, oh, 
Go ahead, be seated. Everyone's seated, so that's fine. <laughs> um, and uh, you may want to stand for the glory of Patri in a moment. But let us join together in our prayer of confession, first in unison and then uh, pausing for a moment of silent and personal prayer. Let us pray together. Triumphant God, we join the crowd today cheering your entry into our lives. But how quickly we turn from shouts of joy to taunts of rejection. In the moments when tough choices have to be made, we build walls to keep people out instead of building bigger tables to invite more guests. We, the builders of these walls, have rejected you, the chief cornerstone. Give us courage to build tables instead of walls. Give us strength to accept your call upon our lives. Give us righteousness that we might know the difference between what is easy and what is right. Amen. Friends, we have good news to share with one another on this Palm Sunday. The scriptures ask, who is in a position to condemn us? Only Christ. And yet Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Indeed, Christ prays for us. Whoever is in Christ, the old life is dead and gone, and the new life has begun anew again this day. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of Christ be with you. Thank you. Okay, let us go to prayer and we will conclude with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious God, we gather to worship you on this special day. Like your followers long ago, we sing our hosannas and wave branches with joy. Our children led the way to make this day a happy one. But we must remember that today ushers in a very significant week, one that is both inspiring and horrifying. Help us to remain with you through your hour of suffering and sacrifice, as well as these moments of joy. We look forward to the day of resurrection when we will once again sing our alleluias. We pray this day for all the victims of violence and war, for those affected by the terrorist attack in Moscow, the ongoing wars in Ukraine and Gaza, and the crisis at our border. May peace, your peace, prevail in all these troubled places and in all our hearts. We pray for those whose lives have been affected by cancer. We pray for treatments. We pray for comfort. We pray for uh, the ability to come alongside one another in a time of need. And we're thankful for the opportunity to do that. We pray for those grieving the loss of a loved one, especially the loss of a child, and the special grief that that brings to that family. May they know your comfort and your presence with them during this difficult time. Pray for those who are discouraged by life for whatever reason. May they know that they are not alone, and may we reach out to those in need around us, whether that need be emotional, spiritual, or physical support. We pray all these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Our Old Testament reading today is Psalm 118. Su Yun from our confirmation class. Good morning. The first reading is Psalm 118, verses 19 through 29. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord. As we look to the gospel, we are opening Luke, Luke's version of the triumphal entry, and then also a reading of the seven last words. This would be the sixth of those seven last words. First, a passage on the Palm Sunday or the triumphal entry, as it's often called. Luke chapter 19, verses 20, uh, 37 to 42. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Then Luke chapter 23, verses 44 to 47. It was about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. While the sun's light failed and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God and said, Certainly this man was innocent. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I've been reading a biography of King Charles lately. Elizabeth got it for me for Christmas and knows I'm a mild uh, royalty buff <laughs> from being a Canadian. Like most biographies, it spends a lot of time describing his childhood and even goes back into that of his parents, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip, before getting into his life's work. But then again, he had the weirdest career ever, didn't he? His job was to sit around and wait for his mother to die. <laughs> How's that for a job description? Now she finally has, and in his 70s, he gets to begin the most important chapter of his life. Let's hope it's just more, more than just a few years after waiting seven decades to get to his life's work. The Gospels are, in effect, biographies of Jesus. Of course, they are ancient documents that don't follow current patterns for a complete biography of parental heritage and childhood and education and so on. History it was storytelling in antiquity. 
So the Gospels are telling the story of this man from Galilee. And we have four Gospels or biographies or stories about Jesus. My confirmation kids can rattle them off for you, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Each of them tells the story in a unique way. The first three are quite similar, and John takes all kinds of poetic license to tell the story the way he wants to. Just as it is better to have several eyewitnesses of an accident in order to get the complete story, so it is helpful that we have the four evangelists. Of the four evangelists, only Matthew and Luke say anything about the birth of Jesus, and only Luke has a story about his childhood, and only one. By far, most of the material in all the Gospels is devoted to his career, his ministry, which we believe was only about three years long. More than 90% of the Gospel narrative then is telling what happened in those last three years. And even over a third of that is focused on the last week. One week. With everything Jesus did in his life and through those three years of ministry, it all comes down to one last week. We've come to call it Holy Week or Passion Week. And Palm Sunday is the invitation to enter that week. Each of the four Gospels has some version of Palm Sunday or what we have also come to call the triumphal entry. Because each Gospel has some version of this happy occasion of Jesus and his followers coming into Jerusalem where they're greeted like royalty, like a parade. The crowds lay down their cloaks and he rides on a donkey and John says they wave palm branches. Only John says that. In most Gospels, they shout Hosanna, which means, God, save us. Luke's version of the triumphal entry is a little more muted than the others. There are no Hosannas, did you notice that? And no palms. But there are cloaks, and there's the donkey, and they shout joyfully, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Then, unique to Luke, they shout, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Does that sound familiar? It's an echo of what the angel said when Jesus was born in Luke's version of the story. Glory to God in highest heaven and on earth peace and goodwill to all. It is a joyful scene that we reenact every year with our palm procession as we sing all glory, laud, and honor. But in each of the stories of the triumphal entry, there is some foreshadowing of the darker events that are to come. Luke's version of that foreshadowing is when the Pharisees ask him to tell his disciples to stop. And Jesus replies, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And in that very next verse, it says, Jesus looked over Jerusalem and wept, realizing that the people were blind to the things that make for peace. There was violence to come that week and more bloodshed to come in the decades to follow. Because just in a few years, Jerusalem would be sacked by the Romans and the temple would be destroyed. The stones really would cry out. Scholars puzzle over why the Pharisees tell Jesus to calm down his followers. Were they giving him an ultimatum? Shut up or else? Or were they being more benign, maybe even helpful? Rather than threatening Jesus, some scholars think they wanted to keep him safe. They even address him respectfully, Rabbi, tell your people to stop. They didn't want him to get into trouble by creating a scene. Basically, they just didn't want him to stir things up. The late John Lewis famously talked about getting into good trouble. There's a time and place for keeping the peace, but there are times when it is more important to cause trouble, good trouble. Jesus said if he muzzled his people, then the stones would cry out. There are some things you just can't put a lid on. During Holy Week in 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King was invited to join the good trouble that people like Ralph Abernathy and others were getting into in Birmingham 
Alabama. On Wednesday of Holy Week, a circuit judge issued an order banning all parading, boycotting, trespassing, and picketing. He was trying to shut it down. Well, the leadership of the movement agreed they needed to disobey that order. And on Good Friday, King and Abernathy were arrested and thrown in jail. Over Easter weekend, Dr. King wrote a treatise we have come to know as a letter from the Birmingham jail. It's a long letter with many famous quotes, but the theme of the letter was basically challenging other clergy who wanted him to calm down and be less disruptive. They wanted him to be more patient. Time, things will change. Not to be so confrontational. And it's like King was echoing Jesus on Palm Sunday when he warned that if he gave up, then the stones would cry out. People would turn to more violent forms of protest. Here's a short quote from that letter. And I am further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble-rousers and outside agitators those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that would inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. Dr. King also said, the ultimate tragedy is not the oppression and cruelty by the bad people, but the silence over that by the good people. Palm Sunday is an invitation to Holy Week and the important events that take place in the life of Jesus. But Palm Sunday is also a call to action. Because if we, the followers of Jesus, remain silent about oppression, or cruelty, or injustice, then the stones will cry out. And if we want to answer that call, it's hard to know where to start, isn't it? We may want to speak up on behalf of the children of Gaza who are facing starvation. But we don't want to offend our neighbors, and we don't want to get too political. I don't have the answers, but we cannot remain silent. We need to talk to our neighbors. We need to care. If we don't speak up, then those who are more angry and willing to resort to more hatred and violence will step in. We may want to end the suffering in Ukraine, but what can we do? We may not want migrants overwhelming our resources, but we need to care about the innocent children. We may want to change policy at the border, but we also need to respond to the need right in front of us. We may care about our LGBTQ youth, but we don't want to get too involved about defending their rights. It's too confrontational. But if we are silent, the stones will cry out. Acts of violence against our precious youth will increase, as will acts of self-harm. Palm Sunday, according to Luke, is a call to action. But we must never forget that Palm Sunday is still a story about Jesus and his last week in Jerusalem. Palm Sunday begins that intense week that takes us through the Last Supper, the betrayal and arrest of Jesus, and of course, the crucifixion. And even on that cross, Jesus could not be silenced. In those few hours, Jesus gave us seven last words that are full of love, forgiveness, compassion, and wisdom. During this Lenten season, we've been reflecting on those last words with the help of a little book by Adam Hamilton called Final Words. And Palm Sunday is the sixth Sunday of Lent, so we must take a moment to reflect on the sixth word from the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit. Like some of the other words from the cross, it is a direct quote from the Psalms. Hamilton likes to think Jesus memorized that line from Psalm 31, 5 because it was a prayer that perhaps his mother taught him. He suggests Jewish mothers have for generations taught their children to pray each night, into your hands I commit my spirit, as an act of faith and confidence in God's care and providence. Maybe there's a connection to the prayer my mother taught me, and maybe you learned it too. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. 
Maybe we should have stopped there because I think it's a bit much to tell the kids to say the rest of the prayer. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. How many learned that as a child? <laughs> well, Shel Silverstein has a cynical version of that prayer. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my toys to break so none of the other kids can use them. Amen. <laughs> Father Mulcahy on MASH had the right attitude. Now I lay me down to sleep, a bag of peanuts at my feet. If I should die before I wake, give them to my brother Jake. <laughs> Into your hands I commit my spirit was the prayer of a dying man in his last moments. But it is also a statement of faith. It is not only asking God to guide his soul into heaven, it is a declaration that God can be trusted. You don't commit your spirit into the hands of someone who is not trustworthy or faithful. Into your hands I commit my spirit is a reminder that we are in good hands. In death and in life, we are in good hands. We are in God's hands and God can be trusted in this life and in the life to come. Into your hands I commit my spirit, but we should also pray, into your hands I commit my work, my family, my life, because we are in good hands. Amen. <laughs> Let us continue to worship God as we meditate on these thoughts from Scripture and bring to God our tithes and offerings, uh, offerings including our the one great hour of sharing offering. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you this day thankful for your many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. And so out of your generosity, we give back a portion now, not only for our regular offerings for our church, but also for this one great hour of sharing. May these gifts be multiplied that the good news of the love and compassion and justice of Jesus Christ could go forward from this place and around the world. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It's been good to be together and to reflect on that wonderful day for all its joy and yet also to begin that journey into Holy Week and to reflect on the events that are to come. Hope you come back on Monday, Thursday. We'll look at that last of the seven words. It is finished on Thursday evening as we gather around the Lord's table together and then darken the sanctuary with tenebrae. Well, if we remain silent, the very stones will cry out. We have a message, a message of God's love, God's justice that we need to share with those around us or others will take up that cause with less uh, uh, helpful results, like Dr. King said. Our confirmation kids have provided some refreshment for us today, so thanks to our confirmation youth. And I'll go run and get a vacuum, and I'm sure some helpful soul will take it over for me to run the vacuum this out, <laughs> clean this up. And trustees will meet down at the uh, Aiken Room at 11.30, getting a lot done to freshen up our sanctuary and take care of our resources in this place. Thank you to our trustees. Now receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you and all God's people said. Amen. <laughs>